Good morning on my behalf. My name is Jussi Roine. I'm based in, in Helsinki, Finland. And I've been an MCT for about 12, 13 years or so. I also did my Microsoft Certified Master uh, Certificate last year, just in time so that Microsoft could cancel the whole advanced certification. So I'm happy to have paid a lot of money for that. But I know some, of, some, some people in the world still know what it is. So I'm, I'm able to extract some value from those three different letters. So the topic would be SharePoint. And uh, instead of going through all the features that SharePoint has, you probably have access to all the materials that Microsoft has provided. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about when to use SharePoint Online, when to use SharePoint Server on-prem, and when not to use SharePoint. And it seems that SharePoint is not the best platform for all kinds of different needs, even though if you go to sharepoint.microsoft.com, and they state that you're capable of doing anything with SharePoint, and that's not really true. I've been working with SharePoint since 1996 in Site Server, which was kind of the basis for SharePoint. And uh, for the past three or four years, SharePoint has been evolving a bit more, and now it's shifting quite heavily to Office 365. So what we'll cover is SharePoint itself, and this is often, often what I see with my customers. I do a lot of consulting, I do a lot of architectural designs, also a lot of trainings. And customers often have a problem, and for one reason or another, they choose to use SharePoint to, to solve that problem. And what often happens is that they have many more problems after choosing SharePoint. And it's not necessarily the, the, the fault of SharePoint being bad or buggy or something else. It's the problem of SharePoint not really being a single product. It's a stack of features, and you need to know what to choose from there, and need to know what not to use from there. The, the, the typical example I use with customers who don't really know what, what SharePoint has to do, be it a training or a deployment or something else, is that when you deploy, let's say, Windows 8.1, you still have Notepad, you have MS Paint, which are fairly good, for the, that random use on a daily basis. But you don't really do uh, image editing in Microsoft Paint. You use it to, to do some clipping or changing a color, and that's about it, because you, you don't have access to something more advanced. And in SharePoint, there's a lot of functionality that could be more advanced, but it's there. So, so it's really up to the architect or the customer to choose what do we leave out, what do we replace, and what do we simply use as it is? And that's the challenge with SharePoint. I also saw, saw this nice picture. People seem to have a fairly bit of hatred against SharePoint. Uh, after living and breathing SharePoint for about 10 years full time, most nights and weekends as well, at certain moments I would agree with this, but most of the time SharePoint is, is quite nice to work with. So. Oftentimes, customers don't really know what to do with SharePoint. So it, it, it reminds me of Office Space, the movie that you've probably seen. So what it is that you're supposed to do with SharePoint, you just did your next, 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 next deployment, and that's that. What happens next? It's only the deployment that you've done. Now you need to choose what, what do you want to do with the product. And that's when the real fun actually starts. So. I'll try to explain SharePoint to you in one slide. Sadly, that won't be the only slide that I have today, but I don't have too many slides. I have a couple of quick demos that I, that I hope that I'll have enough time to show you. And I'll also discuss with you about the differences between SharePoint 2013, which is the on-premises, setup, next, 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 reboot, you're all done, and SharePoint Online, which you basically pay a monthly fee and start using and hoping that it works. And let's also briefly look at the customization model in SharePoint 2013 and SharePoint Online. I'm not opening Visual Studio. I'm not opening any code editors, but I'll just show you a demo on how things should be done in the future, regardless of what you see on MSDN or TechNet, because they're lagging behind about six to 12 months. So this is the slide. No, not really. So SharePoint, it's a platform and also a product for providing collaboration services. That's what it's supposed to be. 
But as always happens, you can bend SharePoint to do something else as well. So you can deploy that and imagine that instead of using SharePoint to run our intranet or extranet or document management or search solution, let's tweak SharePoint so that it's capable of doing media streaming. Or let's tweak and bend SharePoint so that it's capable of, of, of providing uh, user authentication services for external services. And it's still possible. And this being because SharePoint has a bunch of APIs that you can use. It has a lot of hidden functionality, which is kind of documented, but not really. So if you have enough time, you can just go through the files on the disk. You can go through the databases and find all kind of interesting stuff that you kind of hope that, well, maybe I could use this one as well. One sad example is that SharePoint used to have a kind of e-learning feature that you could use to store your training materials, publish those, have classrooms, have, have teacher accounts, and, and the whole procedure built in. And that's still in SharePoint 2013, but it's disabled. And if, if you figure out how to enable that, it gives you that functionality, but it's not supported by Microsoft. So even if you go there, start using it, go to production, be happy with that. Come next Service Pack 1 next year, things might break and you're out of support. You, you've been out of support because you use features that shouldn't be used. And that's the challenge with SharePoint. It's, it, it has too much going on under the hoods. So what you see on the browser and through the typical admin tools is what you should be doing, nothing else. So in SharePoint, you can do the typical intranet, extranet services. And based on, on needs, these can be anything. Typically, it's document management, discussion boards, some kind of social features. It could be the built-in SharePoint newsfeed functionality, or it could be Yammer. And there's a huge discussion going on on should I use newsfeed, which is built in with SharePoint, or should I use Yammer, which is a uh, cloud-based service, or could I use both? Not really, no. Uh, then you can use it for public-facing sites. And the sad truth when you start building SharePoint for public-facing sites, uh, a .com site, is that typically you cannot achieve a good-looking site with the proper CMS functionality in less than about $100,000 plus licenses. So that's about $150,000. It's not impossible, but typically it doesn't happen because there's too much stuff you need to do, and that takes a lot of time from the customer, from the partner that, that implements that, and from the MCTs who need to train those people. And you can also use it for line of business apps, meaning that let's just deploy SharePoint. Let's not worry anything about what's in there. But there's a functionality that we want to use elsewhere. Search is one really good example. It's really good. It's, it's not Bing or Google, but it's still really good. And you can use that, but not expose SharePoint to anybody, because you can simply use the APIs and use the search-related functionality. But then under the hood, you have a lot of smaller workloads that you can choose. So for example, let's say that I want to go with uh, search and I need some BI functionality. That's still fully supported. I don't need to build an intranet. I don't need to build an extranet. I can just choose to go with these two tiny functionalities and implement those as I see fit. So what SharePoint is not? It's not the best platform for building public facing sites. Uh, I've been building SharePoint-based uh, sites for public use for about five or six years since it was mature enough to be used as such a platform. And oftentimes, it's, it's somewhat challenging, and there's a lot of missing functionality that companies expect should be in there, because isn't this supposed to be the best portal platform ever? So one prime example is responsive web design. If you, if you want to have a responsive website that's capable of fitting the content on different size devices, sizes, devices with different capabilities, SharePoint doesn't have anything for that. You can basically build that on your own, and then you start figuring out, why did I choose to use SharePoint? Because I'm actually building the whole thing from scratch, and SharePoint doesn't really provide me with anything. Uh, so it's going to be expensive. It's still possible. But I would say it's, it's most suitable for enterprises, for global companies who really need to have a similar unified platform. 
For anything smaller, I would choose something else. Uh, it's not also clear on how to do certain things. Uh, a simple example would be, I need to add a metadata column in my document management environment. Let's say that when I upload a document, I need to add uh, a type of classification. Is it public? Is it classified? Is it secure? Or is it something else? You could easily do that through the mouse and, and the typical admin interfaces. Click a new column, set the data type, and that's that. But how do I do that in an environment with development environment, testing, Q&A, and production? I don't want to do that four times. I want to do it once and then just migrate those settings to the different environments. And it's not really clear on what the best approach for that would be. There's about five different ways of doing that, plus all the custom code you can fit in to do the same stuff. So you see these, these com companies building SharePoint platforms. One is using SharePoint Designer, which was used to be called front page. The other is using the browser. The third guy is using PowerShell. The fourth guy is using .NET. The fifth guy is using JavaScript, and they all use different APIs. And they kind of achieve the same end result. But in the long run, when you start upgrading from SharePoint 2010 to 2013, or 2013 to whatever comes next, you might run into problems. And that's when you have a lot of issues. How do we fix this before we move on? Because somebody did something they were not supposed to do. Um, it's still a single product in terms of marketing. But in SharePoint 2001, which was the first public version of SharePoint, somebody decided that let's hide all the technical files, all the UI files, JavaScript, CSS, and whatnot, everything in a folder, which is hidden beneath program files, common files, Microsoft shared, uh, web server extensions, version number, blah, 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 because nobody wants to edit those. And now, 10 years after, we still have the same files in the same subfolder, in a really long path, and we still need to edit those because we cannot break it and change it to something else. So there's a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of duct tape in SharePoint to keep it together. And that's the challenging part when you want to learn a bit more about it. Uh, it's not technically superior to any other platforms. Uh, one common argument that people use when talking about SharePoint is that there's a built-in support for Office clients which is true. But now that we have Office Web Apps, which basically gives me uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote in browser, and for typical use, that's often enough. I don't really need to have the rich clients for typical document management use, for random uses at least. So SharePoint is still good on those, but it's, it's, it's not the only one that is capable of doing that. And it's not an easy product to master. Once again, because there's so many ways to achieve a certain end result, and nobody tells you what the best one is. So people argue that, well, I'm going to TechNet, and it tells me I need to do this. And somebody else tells you, that, no, no, you cannot do that because it will do X, and then it will, it will do Y, and then it will, it will do Z, and it breaks everything. Yes, but TechNet is telling me this because it's lagging behind six to 12 months, and that's the problem. Nobody gets paid to write content on TechNet that gives you the best solution. People get paid to produce content on TechNet, and that's that. And it's not the same as the best product, uh, best solution. So SharePoint 2013 versus SharePoint Online, what's the difference? One is cloud, one is on-prem. Is it the same? Not really, no. So SharePoint 2013 is always on-prem, or you could use a hosting provider or Windows Azure, but it's still two different products. There's the foundation and there's the server. Foundation is free of charge by default, but if you want to expose that to external users, you need some kind of licensing. You also need to license SQL Server and Windows Server in there. And SharePoint Online, it's not really SharePoint anymore. It's a product that used to be SharePoint a couple of years ago, and now it's a cloud-based service that has been modified so that it looks like SharePoint, it kind of acts like SharePoint, but there's a lot of different stuff under the hood that you're not capable of getting with SharePoint on-prem anymore. One example would be the new BI features. So some of the Power BI features are available on SharePoint Online and Office 365, but not with the on-prem SharePoint. 
and that seems to be the way that Microsoft wants to, wants to move forward with these two products. Let's add new capabilities in the cloud, and let's not really add new capabilities with the on-prem, because it's lagging behind. Hopefully we'll get some of those eventually with the on-prem version. So SharePoint 2013 always requires SQL Server 2008 R2 uh, SP1. That's the minimum. It can be a shared platform. It can be a dedicated. You could also use SQL Express, but with the limitations in SQL Express, nobody really wants to use that. Uh, it requires a lot of work to achieve a proper configuration. If you do a typical next, 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 reboot, run Windows updates, it kind of works, but not really. Uh, user authentication works, but user profiles do not work. You need to do a lot of AD configuration to get that sorted out. You also need to do a lot of power shelling to get all the tiny features up and running. Workflows do not work. It requires a separate, separate deployment. Office web apps require a separate set of servers. So there's a lot of stuff that takes time before you eventually are at the same uh, set of functionality that SharePoint Online gives you out of the box. I typically estimate about five to eight days for setting up SharePoint, just so that we have it there. Not because it's amazingly complex, but because every environment is so different. You're missing uh, permissions, you're missing service accounts, and it takes time to get those. Uh, anything is basically possible with the on-prem version. You can just open Visual Studio, use .NET, do whatever in there. Nobody is telling you not to do stuff. But there's a certain set of rules that you should follow, and you can still bend those rules a bit, especially with JavaScript now. And the release cadence is about two to three years, although a couple of weeks ago Microsoft did state that they are fastening that something similar like Visual Studio nowadays has. So a new release every 12 months, and we'll see what happens with SharePoint in that. Because companies are not happy in upgrading SharePoint. It, it takes a lot of time. Uh, in SharePoint Online, it's part of Office 365 plans. You pay a monthly fee for each user, and you get most of the same features that you would get with the on-prem. There used to be some really specific, quite important features that you wouldn't get but now they've been introduced with the cloud service. So you're getting those as well. What you're lagging uh, behind is BI mostly and integration. If you have on-prem data on SQL Server or MySQL or Oracle or something like that, there's a couple of different approaches that you can use to expose that data to the cloud. But it takes time and effort, a lot of customization, and companies often don't feel good about exposing their internal data to a public cloud-facing service. They want to do something else, and that's why they choose SharePoint on-prem, oftentimes. Uh, Microsoft also states that this is the future, meaning that all of the new uh, innovations are introduced to Office 365 first, and then later, maybe, to the on-prem version. That's, that's a bit sad, but at the same time, when I start doing something with SharePoint Online, I don't really have to spend a lot of time for deploying stuff. I save about five to eight days per deployment project for not doing the typical basic stuff. That's already done, and I can concentrate on doing the added value stuff on top of SharePoint, and that frees up my time to do something else as well within Office 365 or on-prem. So SharePoint Server 2013, a typical deployment, that you would see, I would say in Europe at least, this is a really typical deployment on having SharePoint 2013 installed. Two servers, these would be the web servers, and they also run the application services and the APIs and whatnot in there. And one SQL server. It could be highly available or not. It depends on the, on the, on the licensing costs, how much the customers are willing, willing to pay. So this is what, what, what I would say a typical SharePoint expert would work on. And then you go to TechNet and check what Microsoft is kind of implying you should be deploying. And it's this. It's, it's always 26 servers. Just deploy these and you're good to go for 200 users. In reality, with one server, even having SQL Server on the same box, you're capable of going up to 10,000 users. And depending where you're coming from, but at least in Finland or Sweden or Norway, 
we don't have that many companies having 50,000 or 100,000 users and definitely not using at the same time. They might open, the, open a page and then go away and do something else. Maybe because they hate SharePoint or don't, don't want to use that. So the two servers, in theory, are capable of doing about 20,000 users. And depending what they do, what you have on top of SharePoint, you might need more boxes. And if you add more services, you need more boxes. But this here, this is overkill. It's, it's fun, though, having so many servers and, and having kind of your own data center for 20 people intranet. But nobody's paying that anymore. About five years ago, customers would be happy to go with, yeah, let's go with six servers or eight servers. Now they're like, can we use a shared server? We have this with one gig of memory. Yep. What is it for having that kind of deployment? Is, it, is there some kind of reasoning behind it? So the question is, is there reasoning for having this kind of deployment? is that you, you get the scalability so you, and, and security as well. So we would have, let's say, one virtual host in here and some databases in here. So if this fails, we would still have stuff in here. So redundancy in, in some ways, but also scalability. And just in case you want to add something. In SharePoint 2007, they introduced the fast search engine as an external add-on to SharePoint. And the guidance at the time, about 2008, was that if you want to have this up and running, here's a good and typical deployment of 14 search servers. It's like, what? Why do I need so many? Should I be OK with one? And just index my file shares, and that's that. Yeah, but you might need this. So we are inching closer to this kind of deployment model for typical uses. Of course, if you go to a company and they tell you that we have 25,000 users, we have huge BI stuff then you need to scale up. But the whole architecture of SharePoint allows dynamic scaling. You can just throw in more servers and designate what runs where, and you don't need to reboot anything. So that's quite flexible. Um, in admin stuff for SharePoint, you can do almost everything in a browser-based central admin. It's one single portal that a few people should have access to, and you can provision new services. You can manipulate the security settings and you can run most of the stuff through there. But some people prefer using PowerShell. So everything you can do in, in central admin or through the browser, you can also do through PowerShell. The problem is with PowerShell, there's hundreds of different commandlets for SharePoint, and they keep evolving. So in SharePoint 2013, the first beta version that came out a year ago, uh, they had these uh, PowerShell commandlets for managing the cache functionality. And then with the RGM version, they changed the whole instruction set for those. But they still had on TechNet the instruction for the old kind of commandlets. And they would still work, but do different stuff now. So it's often challenging to find what's the correct command for doing X. And it can be possible in PowerShell, or then you need to call from PowerShell something else that achieves the same result for you. Uh, and the old STS ADM, it's a command line tool. It was introduced in SharePoint 2003, I recall. And there's still a couple of commands you can do only through that tool. So we have a different set of tools that we, we need to use, not on a daily basis, but I would say on a weekly or monthly basis. And some add-on tools that I find myself using almost constantly. So you all know Fiddler. That's really good, especially for the new development model. Uh, .NET Reflector, often good when you can't figure out why something doesn't work out. You just use that, open some of the DLLs in SharePoint and start looking, what's this supposed to do? Why doesn't it work out? Uh, and there's a free tool called the ULS Viewer. This is probably the most um, beneficial tool for you to use. Let's say you don't want to use SharePoint. You have nothing to do with SharePoint. You walk into your customer or there's somebody in your classroom asking a question, why do I get this in SharePoint? You get this, it's one EXE file, put it on SharePoint, put it on, it spits out the real-time logs from SharePoint's all services, and you can filter that out. And it even highlights the critical ones in red or yellow. So that's really beneficial if you get some kind of uh, error code. You can trap it with that and see what's really happening under the hood, because the browser-based interface doesn't tell you anything. It tells, it, it tells you, I'm sorry something happened, but you don't really know what. 
So in SharePoint Online, you get the browser-based admin interface. It's actually quite good. Uh, this is a screenshot of, of my Office 365 tenant. I've got some site collections in there, meaning that for different purposes, I use different setups. And the only things I can do are beneath these navigational links in here. And if I go to SharePoint 2013's own central admin, that the whole screen is filled with links and, and buttons and stuff. It's, it's just as if somebody just kept on adding links because you need to have all these. And in SharePoint Online, they figured out that, well, maybe we don't need all of them. Maybe it's enough to have one-tenth of all the links that you would get. Uh, there's also a new client-side object model, meaning that you can call most of the SharePoint functionality and features to JavaScript. So you can uh, build these really thin clients on your mobile devices or a command line tool or an external publishing system that calls into SharePoint and gets some data or puts some data in without doing heavy web service based calls. And this is something new that we get with SharePoint Online, also on-prem version. There's, there's just one problem with this. So you see it's, it's underscore API. This is what you can call. And let's see if my network is still running. This is a, a really simple site within my, my SharePoint Online tenant. Uh, there's a couple of folders, some documents, and uh, I've shared this with external users as well. So people who are not part of my organization and they can use the Microsoft account to log in. So when they have eventually logged in, this is what they'll see. But remember that I also have different site collections, meaning for different customers, and the users shouldn't have access to any of those. So what they can do now, they can just get this address. So I'm calling something which has an ID. And what I do, you can probably figure out what's going to happen next. I do a simple HTTP call to the search API, send a query to get everything from a specific source. And since I'm already authenticated against SharePoint Online on a specific site, when I do a search call, for everything, it spits out everything from all of the tenants. So let's say I have three extranets in my Office 365 for different customers. If I have access to any of those, I can see some of the content from all of those. So what it's basically giving me, it's giving me all of the user IDs and email addresses that have access to any of my Office 365 sites. So a customer came up with, with this and told me that, so how do we disable this? Well, you don't. You don't have access to the firewall. You don't have access to the API. There's no setting for this. So the only thing you can do is hope that your customers are not figuring out how to use this. And that's the problem with certain cloud-based services. You cannot do anything if something breaks. You can just kind of claim a ticket and hope that somebody fixes this. But this is going to be really hard to fix because it needs to go beneath the hood to fix something. So which one is best for my needs? Uh, as mentioned earlier, SharePoint 2013 is best for enterprises, larger companies who are willing to invest a lot of time and effort to fine tune SharePoint to fit their needs. And SharePoint Online is best for almost anything else. The big discussion that often needs to take place is the typical we don't want to be in the cloud. Can we trust the cloud? Can we put our data in the cloud? And there's so many different arguments that you can throw back and forth. What I often use in, in, in such discussions is that, okay, so what, what are other services do you use? Do you use Salesforce? Yeah, of course. Do you use YouTube or Facebook or Twitter? Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, they are all cloud services. And this, this one is as well. But th this has security and you can put passwords on certain things. In Facebook, you cannot do anything. You can just use it and hope that somebody uses the data as they see fit. And even then, some companies, especially in Finland, they feel that, well, we don't still want to expose any of the data to an external party. So then they deploy SharePoint Server on their own data center. And they have this one guy who does IT partially. So they do a next, next setup and say, oh, now it's secure. And nobody really knows what happens after that. So it really depends, but I would say, on a, on a helicopter view, 
this would be the best differentiation between the two services. SharePoint 2013 uh, is best for integration to local data. If you have any cubes, if you have any reports, something you don't want to expose externally, then you need SharePoint locally, basically. Uh, security requirements might be that, well, we cannot use cloud-based services because IT says so. Okay, so let's stick with on-prem version then. And certain specific features like search with specific settings that you're not able to manipulate in the cloud, then you would go with the on-prem. And SharePoint Online is best suited for extranets and smaller intranets. It can be larger as well, but since you have limited access on anything beyond the browser, you have a basic set of APIs that you can use. It will be challenging to, to bend SharePoint to your will in the cloud. When Office 365 was released, uh, we had this one customer in Finland. They didn't want to deploy SharePoint on-prem because it seemed to be too expensive. So they went with SharePoint Online for the public-facing side. There's that option still exists. But the, the options to manipulate the UI and, and create a nice looking website in the cloud is really limited. So they found out a way to bypass the security boundaries in Office 365 and they hired this Indian company to, to recreate everything they needed in SharePoint in JavaScript because they couldn't upload server side code. So they got that up and running and it was actually working quite nicely. So in the end, they had a public-facing global site that they paid about four euro per month. A single client access license was enough. And it was running their whole SharePoint infrastructure. And that's not really what the cloud is for. But they were happy with that. But then when you run into problems, there's not much you can do except fix stuff. And with the on-prem version, you don't have to fix stuff when it's working, when you eventually get it working. So pricing, licensing, uh, it's a bit complex with the on-prem version. It's licensed per server as well as per user. And the cloud is licensed per user per month. So on-prem version, number of SharePoint server licenses, let's say it's going to be two, like in the example before. Uh, number of SQL server licenses per core, let's say we go with two, which is the minimum. Uh, number of authenticated users and either standard or enterprise client access license, let's say it's 1,000. And number of Windows Server 2012 licenses for all of the servers that you need to buy. I would say at a minimum it's $20,000 for two SharePoint servers, two SQL cores without any users or any Windows Server licenses yet. And on top of that you need to spend about 20 to 100 days mandates of work to actually get something running in there. So that's why it's going to be expensive. SharePoint Online might look a bit lucrative now because you pay $8 or $20 per user per month. So for 20 users, it's the, the, the cost is, is really nothing. But let's say you have 2,000 users. Then the monthly cost is going to be a bit more. And eventually it might be cheaper to be on-prem. But then you need to involving the calculation, the amount of, of IT admin overhead that needs to be done for the SharePoint server on-prem that doesn't have to happen in the cloud burst first. Uh, in the past six months, I would say in discussions like this with customers and, and, uh, and people in my classrooms, it's been that we still want to go with this even though it's more expensive because we feel it's more familiar to us. It gives us more kind of uh, we get this, this, this safe and warm feeling to have the servers with us. But then they're inching closer to this one uh, by deploying extranets in the cloud. Intranet on-prem, extranet in the cloud. And then eventually move stuff to the cloud. The problem is that SharePoint doesn't have a replication engine. You cannot take something that you have in on-prem and say, I want to publish this in the cloud. The typical I would say out-of-box functionality for this would be, well, you could copy and paste the file. And it's not really working if you have 20,000 files. So there's third-party tools, which are fairly expensive, that do some of that stuff and fill some of the need. But moving between the two 
is not as easy as it is for, let's say, link or exchange, which is fairly trivial to move the stuff back and forth. So a couple of words about customization in, 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 uh, in SharePoint in the future. And this is something that's been going on this year, but there's not that much guidance available yet from Microsoft. Uh, the typical customization model in SharePoint, meaning that somebody tells you, I want to change X in SharePoint to look like Y or do something else, or I want to add a new functionality in SharePoint. You would either use SharePoint Designer or you would use Visual Studio. In SharePoint Designer, you simply connect with SharePoint and start fiddling around with the elements that you see. It has a graphical interface. It's fairly easy to use. And in Visual Studio, you get this blank page saying that, so what do you want to do next? Do you want to add an XML file or a CSS file? Sure, that's possible, but you need to code the whole deployment logic in there as well. You could use PowerShell, and you start coding that one as well. So doing simple stuff with Visual Studio often takes a day or two. And in SharePoint Designer, it's next, next, oh, it's done. It took two and a half minutes. So this is hard for companies to understand what the difference is. Why does it take so long for the, for the uh, professionals to do stuff in Visual Studio when it's so easy for an amateur to do in SharePoint Designer? And one problem being with the different environments, moving content and customizations from dev to test to QA to production and back. And that's not possible with SharePoint Designer at all. And in Visual Studio, it's possible. Uh, the old way of doing things, everything is server side. Everything is kind of customized, and if there's a problem, you just open Visual Studio again and start fixing stuff. Uh, the most horrible SharePoint implement and Im implementation that I've seen in 2010 version had about 250,000 lines of .NET code, everything customized. So when you load the front page, you wouldn't really see SharePoint anymore. Everything would be custom coded. So you start wondering, that. so why do we use SharePoint again? Because we've, we've actually rebuilt the whole CMS, but we still pay license for SharePoint. And we need to do patching, and we need to fix things. So SharePoint gives a lot of good stuff, but if you find yourself being part of a project or having a discussion with a customer that they want to replace the core components of SharePoint, then you need to figure out a different way of approaching the problem. Uh, typically, I use the analogy that if you have Windows 8.1 or 8.0, you have this new start menu. You don't start customizing this. You can move around the tiles and resize them, but that's about <coughs> it. And the same should apply to SharePoint 2013. You can move around stuff, you can add new stuff like applications, but you shouldn't redo the start menu just because it's fun doing custom code. Uh, some examples, you've seen how people use duct tape, this is what you see in SharePoint a lot of the times. The, the, um, I once saw an example. A customer wanted to have a sitemap feature. When you click a button, it should show a tree view of what do we have in the intranet. And there's a built-in functionality in SharePoint for that. But the company in charge of building that, they didn't know SharePoint, but they did do know .NET. So they built a custom component that does the same. And it only took them about 15 to 20 days to do it which the customer started paying for. And then they had the identical functionality, which was a bit more slower and full of custom code, when in reality they had that built in. So the age-old analogy in SharePoint used to be, if it's not there, let's just build it. Let's just customize that. And in 2013 and beyond, it's do not customize. Use it as it is. And if something is missing, add a new application in there but don't remove any of the built-in built functionality. So goodbye, full trust code. This is what you see in SharePoint when you have problems. Something went wrong, error, something, something, error. And this is what, causes, what, 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 what users eventually get in SharePoint. And you should avoid these and use something more advanced. If something breaks, it should be hidden in the page and not blow the whole SharePoint page to pieces. So what happens with the new approach? It's called the cloud app model. The naming is not good because people start wondering, so this has something to do with the cloud, right? No, it could, 
but you don't have to use anything cloud-based. Or you can simply use the new functionality to build new kind of applications. It can be on-prem, it can be in the cloud, or it can be a hybrid solution in there. So there's the apps model, similar to what you have on your mobile phones. You go to an app store, you add an app, it gets deployed to your mobile phone, and when you delete that, it simply deletes the app and its files. It works exactly the same in SharePoint now. There's an app store uh, maintained by Microsoft, but you can also set up your own, which runs on top of SharePoint. So when you create in-house applications, you can distribute those internally and even charge money from people if they start using those. Then there's something called the remote provisioning, meaning that instead of going uh, remotely, uh, let's say, use RDP to go on a SharePoint server and start adding those customizations, you can now execute those customizations against a remote SharePoint box and have those deployed. And then everything should be client-side. So instead of using .NET, the default language is JavaScript now. And this is a bit problematic for a lot of .NET developers. People have been doing .NET for about 10 years. They know all the ins and outs of, of, of the framework. And now Microsoft is telling them that, well, maybe you could use JavaScript to do it. The, the API is a bit different, and you don't have half of the stuff you used to have. But it's much better now. So it will take a couple of years to get to the same level that .NET gives us now. But the benefit is that if you use client-side solutions, you can deploy your customizations on SharePoint on-prem, SharePoint in a hosted environment, and SharePoint in the cloud. And it works exactly the same because it's client-side. So it's basically a pattern that allows you to do stuff you used to do on server side, on the client side, and it's less intrusive. It's a bit more complex, but it's more scalable, and it gives you the hybrid approach on how to do things. Let's see if I have still my, my remote desktop open. So here's a different SharePoint. This is an on-prem SharePoint. This is one of, one of my development boxes. Nothing magical about this, SharePoint Server 2013, empty page, basically. So normally, when you want to add a new, con new functionality in here, you would open Visual Studio, do your customization, package that, copy the package in here, use PowerShell to deploy that, come here, click on different buttons, and hope that things work out. If they don't, you go back to Visual Studio and start again. So here's a simple example on, on how to do stuff. I've got one uh, WinForms application. I wanted to build this because it's been a, a, a long time since, since I was capable, to, capable of doing WinForms because nobody wants this anymore. Uh, so what this does, I want to say, let's add a new user interface to SharePoint. So there's a master template, which is similar to a PowerPoint master template. And let's deploy that. It doesn't ask where to deploy. This could be remotely but I've hard-coded to deploy against my, my SharePoint is there. That's done. So it's connecting to HTTP, uploading the file, setting it in use, and that's that. I reload the page, and it has a custom footer now. And the custom footer is picking up my pictures from Instagram, I think. And nothing magical about this. I could easily add this manually on the page, but since, since it's a footer now, on any page that I go to, it has the same custom footer now. And if I later want to manipulate that or just get rid of that, I can just reset the settings and reload the page, and it's gone. There's no service uh, interruption to users, no IIS reset that's required, and I can do this against 10 boxes at the same time if I want to, or just a single site if I want to. I think I also added at some point custom web parts as well that I can put in there. So I can also use this to add custom content in my page. So there's the footer, and there's a custom image that it, that it uploads to SharePoint and deploys that on the front page. It could be text, it, it could be BI stuff, it could be anything. And once again, when I want to get rid of all the, all the stuff that I added, just reload the page and it's empty again. So this is the way how things should be done in the future. It's much more agile. It's much less intrusive against SharePoint. And you don't really have to use anything special 
I've used WinForms and typical .NET, nothing else. So you, you still have all the old stuff. You can use PowerShell, you can use server-side code, but eventually server-side code is going to be removed as an option for doing customization in SharePoint. There's a new function uh, called Design Manager that can be used to create custom UIs in SharePoint. It's a browser-based tool for manipulating the visual elements on the page. It's 1.0, so I'm waiting for the 3.0 so that I eventually get stuff done with that. But for now, it's something that we get. Uh, the logical approach, which I just show you, showed you in the demo, we would have the user in here, we have the SharePoint in here, the user interacts with SharePoint, and SharePoint is hosting the static files, XML, CSS files, and whatnot. And then we have a separate set of servers, which basically need to run a web server. It can be IIS, or it can be something else. And it needs to expose HTML, and that's that. And SharePoint will talk with that server and expose the stuff to client-side object model for the user. So it works similarly what you see in Facebook. If you add an app, it embeds the app as an iframe. It can be full screen or it can be embedded as an iframe. That's the same logic that SharePoint is following now. You run your applications in Azure, in your own data centers, running Windows Server or something else. It can be a Linux box with PHP and whatnot. And you expose certain parts of that in SharePoint, and SharePoint is capable of using those. So whenever you need to upgrade any of your customizations, you upgrade the remote box, and SharePoint doesn't need to do anything. It just loads the content automatically. This is how it should be done, but it's not widely used yet, because it, there's a learning curve, and there's stuff you need to rebuild that you cannot do in .NET anymore. Uh, and the remote provisioning that I showed you, we have the developer in here, we have a SharePoint and the SQL Server, and we simply upload to HTTP any of the XML files, any of the JavaScripts, any of the CSS files, any of the HTML files, and whatever custom stuff you need to have. So as long as the content is static files, not something that needs to be compiled or not binary files, you simply upload those and tell the SharePoint that please use this. And when it's a binary file, it needs to go to SharePoint. And even for that, you can use remote provisioning if you need. In practice, at certain scenarios, you still need to use server-side code because you cannot achieve certain stuff with JavaScript. Let's say you have a long-running operation that needs to talk, talk to backend stuff. You simply cannot do that easily within JavaScript. And in .NET, it's fairly trivial to use whatever you have on the server-side. And for certain uh, UI elements, let's say a custom navigation, quite trivial to build with .NET. There's a simple for it. You go through the stuff, check what permissions you have, and that's that. If you need to do that in JavaScript, you need to go back to the browser, ask the browser to do the same, cache that, and hope that the result look, look good. It takes a bit longer to implement, but then again, that works in the cloud as well. Everything else, you can use SharePoint Designer, click stuff through there, or use PowerShell or something else. In summary, you have the apps framework now. Uh, if you go to the store, the, the marketplace that sells the SharePoint apps, there's a lot of apps, but it's not like the, the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. There's not like two million apps that you can choose from. It's more like 500 apps you can choose from. So it's, it's really new and it needs time to mature a bit more. So if you have 2007, 2010, or 2013 SharePoint coming up, or an existing one, or your customer has one, what do you need to do to move forward if you want to upgrade to a new version? In 2007, just ditch all the customizations. Don't bring them over. Get the functionality that you need, and match that against SharePoint 2013's or SharePoint Online's existing functionality. And if something is still missing, then figure out if it needs to be implemented. And just bring over the content and data, not the custom code. In 2010, 
once again see if there's something already in 2013 or online that you can use and ditch those customizations. But in 2010, you can also recompile your customizations and they still work in 2013. But there's no guarantee if they work in the future versions. And in 2013, if you start a new engagement, new project now, you should use Cloud App Model. Nobody is twisting your arm that you have to use it, but that's the future. That guarantees that in the future you don't have to redo all of your customizations when you don't have server-side object model anymore if it's eventually going to be disabled. Okay, that's that. I think I'm right on time. Any questions? Thoughts? Everything is clear? Good. I think you have a, had a long week or long summit so far. I heard some people took a lot of time in the zona as well. Uh, on my behalf, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me later, and I'll be hanging around here a bit more. Uh, so let's go and get some coffee. Thanks.